Tonight, today, we're going to take a look at a, a very important topic, one we hear about a lot, and it's also a very controversial topic, and I will probably make it more controversial for you by the time I get done. Um, but I do thank you for coming. My name's Fred Martin. I used to be the pastor here at the Evangelical Free Church, and I'm now retired, and they have given me the title Pastor Emeritus. <coughs> you can call me Fred, though, okay? Um, glad you're here. Let's, let's pray together. Please feel free to come over here. You don't have to all crowd into that corner. Um, but I'm glad you're here. We've got plenty of seats over here. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come together and that we can think together as a community of believers. And I pray, Lord, that you'll take what I have to say today and use it to provoke our thinking about what you would want and what you think about Israel and its policies and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So we invite you to come and to be a part of our discussion, our thinking, my presentation. And I ask that you would help all of us to uh, think deeper about this important subject. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a subject that I have been studying really for the last 30 years. And it started in uh, 1985. I was over in Israel. I was taking a class on historical geography. And what I was really interested in was the history of uh, Israel and the land there because I love the scriptures and I wanted to learn more about uh, the background that uh, we have when we understand the Bible. And, it, and during that trip, uh, the study group that I was a part of, we were out at this park, we were overlooking the Sharon Plain and out at the Mediterranean, and someone in our group mentioned to our guide, boy, this is really a beautiful place to have a box lunch, and, and just what perfect scenery. And our guide said, there you go, there used to be an Arab village here. And it was a simple comment, she didn't elaborate on that, she just said, yeah, there used to be an Arab village here. And, and, and that comment stuck in my mind. Because I thought, what do you mean there used to be an Arab village here? What happened to that Arab village? And it occurred to me, well, maybe the Israelis tore down that Arab village. And I had never thought about that before. Because everything that I had heard about the modern state of Israel was that the Israelis wanted the Arabs to stay there and to be a part of this new nation that they were founding. I had heard that over and over again. And yet now I was hearing about an Arab village that had been destroyed. And I thought to myself, maybe there's more to this story than I've ever heard before. And maybe there's some things that I need to learn here that I haven't learned before. And so that's what really got me started. Just that one comment. Didn't know what to make of it. Got me started, and for the last 30 years or so, I have gone back to Israel, and I have done a great deal of reading and studying and thinking, and that's what I'm going to share with you within a very short time. So my presentation this morning is going to be brief. I'll keep it as brief as I can, and then I have some recommendations. There's a sheet over here of recommended literature, sources where you can go if you want to learn more about this subject. But let's begin with this Bible verse. James 1, 19, you're all familiar with it. <laughs> Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And that's what I hope you'll do today, is you'll be quick to listen. You may not agree with everything I have to say, that's okay, but listen to it. <coughs> and if it goes against everything you've been taught, then I hope you'll be slow to become angry. At least give it a shot, okay? Here's another one of my favorite Bible verses, Proverbs 18, verse 17. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. We usually put it this way, there are two sides to every story. And what I want to suggest to you today is that there are two sides to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we need to hear both sides. So let me expand a little bit on uh, Proverbs 18, verse 17. 
First thing I'd suggest that you do is that you search out both sides of any issue. And that certainly applies with Israel and Palestine. There are two sides. There's what's called the Israeli narrative, and there is also what is called the Palestinian narrative. And I would encourage you, listen to both. Don't, list, don't believe either one of them entirely until you've checked it out. And I would say the same thing about what I'm telling you today. Don't believe everything I say. I'll give you some resources where you can go and check it out to see if what I've said is really true. Because I think I'll probably say some things you haven't heard before. It's often said that the first casualty of war is the truth. That's true with any conflict. So we need to search out and really verify what we have heard. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to emphasize the Palestinian narrative, the Palestinian perspective on what's going on over in the Middle East. And let me tell you why I do that. It's because I'm almost sure that you have heard the Israeli narrative. Because that's what we hear here in the United States. That's so often what we hear from other Christians. We hear the Israeli side. That's not the way it's identified. People don't say, well, I want to present you the Israeli perspective. Instead, what we hear is, here's what's happening in Israel. And we hear that over and over again. And I'm going to push the Palestinian perspective. I think of it as a teeter-totter. If you're going to get a teeter-totter balanced, you need to have equal pressure on both sides. The Israeli narrative has been presented so strongly in the United States that the teeter-totter is tilted this way. And for me to try to bring it back into balance, I need to push really hard on the Palestinian side. So that's what I'm going to do. I want you to know that. This is not a balanced perspective. Because I really am convinced most of us here in the United States, particularly in evangelical churches, have heard the Israeli narrative to such an extent that we think it's the only story. Here's the second thing. Be on guard against polarization. So often when we hear this subject being addressed, it's either you're pro-Israel or you are anti-Israel. And if you say anything critical of the policies of modern day Israel, you are anti-Israel. And I want to suggest to you that there are other possibilities. So how many of you have ever disagreed with any policy of the American government? Okay. Does that make you anti-American? No. It's the same way. There are things that I believe that Israel has done that are wrong, and I think that we need to look at them very critically. Now, that doesn't mean I am anti-Israel. So don't fall into these two categories, where you're either pro-Israel or you're anti-Israel, and there's nothing else. There are other possibilities. I also want to suggest that you beware of the media. And I'm not saying that because I'm anti-media. There's no news organization that presents everything perfectly. We should acknowledge that. What I'm saying is this, that the media tend to focus on the most shocking and photogenic events that produce good ratings. You know, every news organization is in the ratings business. They want people to watch. And so they often pick on the things that they have pictures of and that'll catch people's attention because that'll boost the ratings. They don't necessarily uh, tell you about the less exciting aspects of an event that they don't have any pictures for. When you listen to the media when it comes to Israel and Palestine, just look with a little skepticism. And here's the fourth thing. Look beyond the symptoms to the root cause. So we see on the news about suicide bombers. Within the last year, we've heard in the news about Palestinians who will take a knife. A single Palestinian will come up and attack some Israeli soldier at a checkpoint. Well, that's big news. But we need to ask, is there more to the story than that? What's behind this? Is that stand by itself, or is that a um, symptom and not the root cause? So I just give those to you based on, uh, try to expand on Proverbs 18, verse 17, and uh, <coughs> just listen to both sides of the story. So let me give you some examples here from history. And I do want to mention before I forget, on the element of history, I have a handout here for you. Uh, feel free to pick it up. There's no charge for this. It's called The Origin of the Problem. It's about an 18-page 
uh, and that's very short, 18-page uh, presentation of the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it's a perspective that I agree with, and it's probably different from the one you've heard, so please feel free to pick one of those up uh, at the end of our session. Let's take a look. This is very quick. Here was the UN partition plan in 1947. The UN voted on uh, saying there's only one way we can solve this huge problem that we have over here in uh, the land, and that is to partition the land uh, between the Jews and the Arabs. And so this was the map that the UN came up with. So you see here, uh, the white part is the, all the Jewish part. What a strange way to make a map and try to divide two countries. Here's the Arab part, and Jerusalem is going to be an international zone uh, that was not under the control of the Jews or the Arabs. That was the plan. And so often, according to the Israeli narrative, we hear something like this. In 1947, the UN put forward a plan to partition the land between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Israel accepted the plan, and the Palestinians rejected it. And if the Palestinians had only accepted it, there would have been peace, and they would have had their own state all the way back from 1947. And the problem was, the Palestinians rejected the partition plan. They're the ones that are responsible for the conflict. Let me suggest to you that there is also another way to look at this. Take a look at these statistics. The population prior to the partition plan, the Jews were 35% of the population, and the Arabs were 65% of the population. So there were almost twice as many Arabs living in that land as there were Jews. But when the partition plan came out, the Jews received 57% of the land, and the Arabs received 43% of the land. Now, if you were an Arab, would you go, oh yeah, that's fair? Or would you say, wait a minute, why do you divide the land that way? How come we get so much less land than our population would? It's not the same proportion at all. Now, is it really surprising that the Arabs rejected the plan? Now, statistics aren't the whole story. Take a look at this. If you look at this area down here, this is called the Negev, largely desert. So, is that the prime land? So that tilts the statistics some. But if you look up here, this is the most fertile part. This is the part where most of the people live, right in there on the Sharon Plain. Arabs live there too. So why did the Jews get the best land? So again, what I'm saying is, we can talk about the statistics back and forth a lot, recognize that the Jews did get the Negev, which wasn't the prime property, but the Jewish people did get the most fertile place and where the biggest city, Jaffa, was of the Arabs. But it's worth thinking about. The percentages didn't match the proportion of the population. And I saw that one question. Uh, let, me go, let me go through this whole thing, and then we'll have a time for questions. I think you answered it. OK. It depends on what kind of land it is, really. That's yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Statistics don't tell the whole story, but they certainly are <clears throat> eye-catching and make you think, hmm, maybe something wasn't quite right here. Let's take a look at uh, the story that we often hear about the, uh, the war in 1948. Here's the nationality, the Israelis. Uh, there were 650,000 Zionists or Jews living in the land, 650,000. The Palestinians in that same land, there were 1,200,000. And the Arabs in the surrounding nations, 30 million. So the Israelis were a very small uh, minority compared even to the Palestinians in the land and particularly if you bring in all the Arabs. And so we're told, this is the Israeli narrative, look, here were these Israelis, and they were attacked by five armies. So on May 15th, uh, 1948, 
when Israel was declared as a nation, um, immediately they were outnumbered terribly, and immediately five Arab armies attacked uh, the Jews. But that's not quite the whole story either. If you look at the numbers, in the middle of May in 1948, there were 35,000 Jewish soldiers. The five Arab armies only had 28,000 in their numbers. The war went on in June of 1948. There was a ceasefire, but then the war started again in the middle of July. And when that took place, there were 65,000 Jewish soldiers, and the Arab armies numbered 40,000. So we hear about how these five <coughs> Arab armies came and they outnumbered all of the uh, Israelis. But if you look at the figures, the Israeli army, the one army, against the five Arab armies, the Israelis had more soldiers. Here's a statement that comes from um, Shlomo Ben-Ami, who uh, has written a book on the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. He is an Israeli. He was also the foreign minister for the Israeli government. So here's a man who was part of the Israeli government, and here's what he has to say about um, the 1948 war. He says, the invasion by the Arab armies did not necessarily mean that the Jews now faced superior Arab forces. The invading Arab armies were ill-prepared for battle, and poorly equipped, they suffered from a total lack of coordination and very low motivation. So it wasn't just that they were outnumbered, is that they were disorganized. So this perspective that, uh, look, Israel was this little David fighting Goliath, that's really not the picture. And even the Israeli foreign minister acknowledges that. Let's go on in history just a little bit. Um, and think about the 1967 war, which is also known as the Six-Day War. Um, I'll refer to it as the 1967 war. Again, here's the, uh, here's the picture of not the partition, but this is how much land Israel came up with, ended up with, after the 1948 war. So if you look at that, you can see that <laughs> they have a lot more land than the UN partition gave to them. They ended up with a lot more. And this is the map that uh, kind of gives the contours of what we're still living with today. So let me just point this out. Here's the, uh, the land of Israel. This was the West Bank. So when I, when I refer to the West Bank, uh, we're talking about here's the Jordan River here. And the West Bank is simply the part of the land that was west of um, the Jordan River. And it was occupied by uh, Arabs. And in 1948, this became a part of the nation of Jordan over here. It's no longer part of Jordan. Um, we'll come to that later on. And then here's the Gaza Strip down here. So when you hear this in the media, uh, if you're not familiar with exactly what they're talking about, those are the key terms, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And the West Bank is sometimes referred to by the Israelis as Judea and Samaria, using their Old Testament names. Uh, it's, uh, it's the same territory, okay? In 1967, in the war, there was another war there, the Six-Day War, and in that time, Israel was able to take over and control the West Bank, and they also took over the Gaza Strip. So today, even though these distinctions between these areas is still acknowledged, all of this is under the control of the Israelis. And the explanation is that in 1967, the Israelis knew that Egypt and Syria and Jordan were going to attack. And so they had a preemptive strike against the Egyptians and the, uh, primarily the Egyptians, but also the Syrians and the Jordanians. 
So, yes, uh, Israel started the war, that's true, it was a preemptive strike, but it was because they knew the Arabs were going to attack, and therefore it was a defensive war. 1967 was a defensive war on the part of Israel, but it was necessary because they knew what they were facing. That's what we hear. That's the Israeli narrative. But let me show you what Yitzhak Rabin, who was the chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Force in 1967, here's what he said later on. I do not believe that Nasser, President Nasser of Egypt, wanted war. The two divisions that he sent into Sinai on May 14 would not have been enough to unleash an offensive against Israel. He knew it, and we knew it. So here's the Israeli chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Force saying, look, we knew that, yeah, he had moved in these uh, troops into the Sinai, but we knew he really wasn't going to start a war because he didn't have enough power. What an admission. And here's what Menachem Begin said. He said, in June 1967, we again had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches do not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. A startling admission. These are not quotes that uh, the Israeli government passes along. We still hear the idea that the 1967 war was purely a defensive war. And here are Yit, uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Menachem <coughs> Begin, who later on became prime ministers of Israel, both acknowledging that's really not the whole story. We decided to start that war. Again, if you want to know more about the history, if you want to hear a different perspective, please pick up that handout there called The Origin of the Problem. Let's just talk a little bit now about what is going on in Israel and the West Bank today. And what I'd like to do is to take a look at what President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu said just a month ago. <coughs> So, February 15th, 2017, just a little over a month ago, in that press conference when Prime Minister Netanyahu came over here, he said there are two conditions for peace. And the first one is this, that the Palestinians must recognize the Jewish state. And later on in the press conference, President Trump said they have to recognize Israel. So the first requirement is you have got to recognize us. And that seems to make so much sense, doesn't it? But there are two problems with those statements. And here's the first problem. The Palestine Liberation Organization recognized Israel's right to exist on September 10, 1993. Almost 25 years ago. Yasser <coughs> Arafat, if you remember it, it was on the White House lawn. There was President Clinton, Yasser Arafat, and Prime Minister Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin. They had this big signing ceremony, it was televised around the world, and part of that was Yasser Arafat signed Resolution 242 of the United Nations recognizing Israel's right to exist. So what do you mean, what's, what's Prime Minister Netanyahu talking about? What is President Trump talking about, saying the Palestinians have to recognize our right to exist? Well, there's more to the story than what it appeared to be. Look again at what these two men said. Prime Minister Netanyahu said, first the Palestinians must recognize the Jewish state. President Trump said they have to recognize Israel. And in our minds, they're saying the same thing. Most of us go, well, wait a minute. The Jewish state is Israel. Israel is the Jewish state. They're saying the same thing. But they're not saying the same thing. Prime Minister Netanyahu knew exactly what he was saying. I'm not sure President Trump knew what he was saying. But Prime Minister Netanyahu certainly knew that the PLO recognized Israel's right to exist back in 1993. So what was he saying when he said they must recognize the Jewish state? Problem number two with those statements. 20% of the citizens of Israel are Palestinians. 
let that sink in just a little bit. 20% of, of the Israeli citizens are Palestinians. One out of every five is a Palestinian. To recognize the Jewish state, and that is the terminology that Prime Minister Netanyahu always uses, because I've heard him say it in a lot of different speeches, it's always the Jewish state. What he really means is, they need to recognize that Israel exists for the Jews, and the Jews only. That's what President, Prime Minister Netanyahu means. He knows that they've admitted that Israel has a right to exist. But they haven't said it's a Jewish state. And if, to recognize that Israel is the Jewish state means that the Palestinian citizens of Israel officially become second class citizens. In other words, you may be a citizen of Israel, but this nation does not exist for you. It exists only for the Jews. That's what Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying. I don't think President Trump recognized that. So it's a very different statement that Prime Minister Netanyahu is making. And he knows that no Arab authority, no Arab government, the Palestinian Authority today, is not going to recognize the Jewish state. Because they're not going to say to their fellow Palestinians who are living in Israel, yes, we will officially agree that you should be second class citizens. They're not going to go along with that. President, Prime Minister Netanyahu knows that, and what he's really trying to do, my opinion here, is that he is delaying the process. He has thrown something out there that sounds very reasonable to much of the world, mostly Americans. It sounds very reasonable, recognize the Jewish state, but he knows it immediately closes off all kinds of negotiations. And he's just buying time. He wants to delay the process. Let's take a look at what's going on in uh, Israel today. Okay, so here we have the land. We have the West Bank. It is under the control of the Israelis. And the Gaza Strip is also under the control of the Israelis. Uh, and even though Israel is in control of, of all the land now, uh, still the West Bank is considered uh, as, as a separate entity that needs to be discussed and negotiated over. What's uh, taking place in the West Bank today? Well, after the Oslo Accords, let me mention this. After the Oslo Accords were signed in 1993, uh, I won't go into all the, there were three different areas that were broken up in the West Bank, Area A, Area B, and Area C. Area A was to be under the control of the Palestinians, and the Israelis exercised some control over the other parts. So this is what is left today of, if you were to go over there today, this is the part that the Palestinian Authority has some control over. The Israelis will send their soldiers in there to those territories anytime they want to. And um, so you can see, it's a, it's, it's getting smaller and smaller as time goes on. There is less and less land that is under the control of the Palestinians. And what's taking place even in those areas? Five things. There are checkpoints. So you can see, if you go back here, you can see that this is all divided up, all these little uh, divisions. Some people have described it as it's a Swiss cheese because it's got so many holes in it. And uh, if, you, if a Palestinian wants to travel from one area to another area, they have to go through checkpoints. Sometimes those checkpoints are shut down. And they don't have any idea how long it'll be before the checkpoint opens again so they can go just a few miles away. And they'll stay, spend hours there waiting for the checkpoint to open up. What about water? The Israelis who are living, who have settlements, I'll come to the settlements later, um, have, they have far more water. The World Health Organization recommends 100 liters of water per person per day. In the occupied territories, Palestinians receive only 60 liters per person per day. There's also the separation barrier. This is a huge wall. Uh, it's not all wall. Part of it's a fence. 
but it goes along the entire 1967 border. And, uh, and you know, you've heard President Trump say, look, the Israelis built a wall, I'm going to build a wall on Mexico. Well, it's this separation barrier that's over 400 miles long. The International Court of Justice issued an advisory opinion in 2004 declaring that the barrier violated international law. So it is not been received by the international community. Part of the problem is that the Palestinians will live on one side of the wall, but their farmland will be on another side of the wall. And the checkpoints to get through are only open a few times during a week or during a month, and it's unpredictable when they're going to be open. So it's another sign of problems for the Palestinians and their life. There's also the practice of administrative detention. Administrative detention means that the Israeli military can come in, can take a, uh, it's usually the men, will, will take somebody and say, we think that you might be a danger to our security and we're going to put you in prison. They won't charge them with anything. There won't be any trial. There will be no indication of how that long that man will have to be in uh, prison. And he's just stuck there. So for example, after the kidnapping and murder of three Israeli teenagers in 2014, brutal murder of three Israeli teenagers, the Israeli Defense Force took 950 Palestinians and put them in prison under administrative detention. They weren't charged with anything. They were just put in prison. No trial. Another thing that takes place is home de demolition. The Israelis come in and uh, will demolish Israeli homes. I mean, uh, Palestinian homes. So for example, when they found out who was responsible for those three Israeli teenagers and their murders, they came and they destroyed the houses of the families of the people who had committed those murders. So if your son or your cousin does something terribly wrong, they come and they blow your house up. This past year, we've seen an increase in home demolitions with a total of 274 homes destroyed.